Right now I'm proofreading 200 Minutes of Mystery and one of the things I like to do when I'm proofreading is I read the story out loud to try to get a sense of, well, to catch mistakes that I otherwise might not make. So today I thought I'd shoot a video of myself reading the story out loud. That's been something I've been doing a bit lately. Um, <clears throat> and so you get to be among the first to hear it because the book hasn't come out yet. But I will have to stop and start a bit to fix the mistakes that I spot along the way. So let's see if this works. The story is called Cutlass. Impossible, Captain Roberts breathed. Close behind him on the dusty track, Gawain, look, Gawain looked up from the tattered map. He peered over his father's shoulder and gasped. All that remained of their treasure was a single gold coin lying on the wet earth at the bottom of the hole. The statues and the rest of the coins were gone. The other three pirates soon arrived. They stared down at the hole, eyes wide. Gawain wiped sweat from his chin. This close to the equator, the heat was unbearable. The rest of the treasure may be deeper, Captain. Rebus, the first mate, stabbed at the sandy dirt with his mattock. Nay, the captain took off his hat and scratched at his scraggly black hair. There's naught else here but sand and despair. And one coin, Gawain thought. It was as if someone had left it behind to taunt them, to prove that the treasure had once been here and was now gone. Rebus crouched down to take a closer look at the hole, rubbing his tattooed arms. His dog, a big wolfhound named Celeste, ran around his legs excitedly. She seemed to sense the growing anxiety in the air. Usually, Rebus would give the dog a job to do to calm her down. Today, he just stared at the empty dirt. Celeste, Gawain said, water. The dog barked and ran off towards the beach, where they had left the rest of their supplies. This little spit of land is uncharted, said Marie. The one-handed pirate was leaning on a tree nearby, chewing something as black as tar. Is it possible there are natives? The captain scanned the trees. We scoured the island thorough-like on our last visit. No evidence of human habitation, and if and were someone here now, there would be signs. Rebus stood up. Maybe the poor bride took the treasure. Gawain cast a nervous glance at the surrounding jungle, which seemed to be getting darker. According to legend, the poor bride was an English commoner who had married a Spanish prince, not for love, but for his fortune. The day after the wedding, they set sail for the new world. They hadn't made it. Not far from this very island, the poor bride had fallen overboard, or perhaps she had been pushed by her new husband. The story was a little different every time. Most pirates agreed, however, that her ghost still roamed these islands, hungry for gold. The poor bride would not have left a single coin, Marie said. The poor bride isn't real, the captain snapped, but Gawain saw him touch the gold chain around his neck, as though checking it was still there. Celeste returned, a water flask in her mouth. She dropped it at Gawain's feet and wagged her tail. Gawain crouched and scratched her behind the ears. Good girl. The other pirates kept bickering, ignoring Gawain. As the teenage son of the captain, Gawain was used to this. No one on the ship pushed him around, but no one befriended him either. He was left alone to indulge his curiosity. Gawain scooped up some of the dirt from around the hole and rubbed it between his fingers. It was crusty and dry, not freshly turned. Someone had dug up the gold statues months or even years. Hmm. Someone had dug up the golden statues months ago or even years. They hadn't done it neatly either. The sides of the pit were ragged as if made by hands rather than spades or by the skeletal claws of the poor bride. Gawain shuddered. Someone might have come, found our treasure and left again, Marie was saying. Aye, but we left no mark, the captain replied. Only the five of us knew where it was. He glanced at his son. Gawain knew that look. He had seen it on his father's brow many times. It meant, get ready for a fight. Gawain had been sailing aboard the Royal Fortune for less than a year. In that time, he had dodged British cannonballs, Amazonian spears, and giant sharks from the deepest, darkest ocean. He had seen his father lie, steal, and even throw a mutinous first mate overboard, but he had never seen him back down from a fight. Gawain noticed that the fifth pirate, Jonah, had already drawn his dagger. Jonah was a little man with a pointed nose and eyes that burned like coals. Gawain had never heard the man speak, or even seen him open his mouth. According to rumour, French explorers had cut out his tongue. Gawain patted his own pockets for weapons, just dust, ball bearings, and a trowel. He had come prepared for digging and carrying, not warfare. It was suspicious that Jonah had brought a blade. Gawain carefully backed away from him, towards Marie's side of the hole. 
Marie spat on the dirt. Be our beloved captain casting aspersions? Just thinking with my mouth, the captain said. Think with your brain instead. Twould be a shame if your mouth got the rest of you into trouble. Marie was an experienced sailor with friends at every port, so the captain tolerated more insolence from her than from anyone else in his crew. Even so, Gawain could see that this was pushing his father's limits. You'll belay that talk if you know what's good for you, the captain said, his handsome face twisted into a scowl. Celeste was digging behind some bushes, as though the treasure might be there. Celeste, heal, Rebus commanded. Instantly, the dog was at his side. Rebus put down his mattock and held up his hands. Cool down, he said. After we buried the treasure, sorry, after we buried the statues, all five of us walked back to the royal fortune together. We sailed her all the way to the Guinea coast. None of us had the opportunity to take anything. One of us could have told someone else where the treasure was, the captain said. Only a fool would trust his accomplice not to keep the gold for himself, Rebus said. Gawain spoke. The five of us did not walk back together. Careful, boy. Marie raised the iron hook that had replaced her right hand. It was fatal to show weakness among the pirates. Gawain stood his ground. Marie hung back, I seem to recall. I seem to recall that too, the captain said. He was tall and seemed to grow even taller as he turned to look at Marie. Jonah is the newest member of the crew, Marie said. Why do you trust him and not me? Jonah smiled and dragged a finger across his throat. Odd that the culprit didn't fill in the hole to hide the theft, Gawain said. They had found it open and gaping. Perhaps she had difficulty using a shovel. He looked pointedly at Marie's hook. The dog started barking, responding to the tension in the group. Celeste was well trained, but could be vicious, Gawain knew. If anyone raised a hand to Rebus, the mutt would bite the fool's leg and never let go. I had a full bladder, Marie said. The boy is trying to distract you. After all, he was the custodian of the, ma of the map. Who knows how many people he... The captain's cutlass was up so fast that Gawain barely saw it move. Choose your words carefully, he snarled. Marie leapt towards Gawain and pressed her hook against his throat. You choose yours, she said. Gawain felt the blood drain from his face. He had seen Marie manipulate her hook as des dexterously as the Chinese sailors he'd met used chopsticks. If she willed him dead, he would die. Let him go, Bart demanded. Now, there we go. So Captain Roberts um, is referred to throughout as Captain Roberts, not as Bart, which is his first name. So we don't even, the reader doesn't even know who Bart is at this point. Um, I'm just explaining that to the publisher. Roberts throughout. Think, Captain. Marie spoke quickly and urgently. If I went back for the treasure, how would I have carried it? Would you not have noticed three gold statues and a sack of coins under my clothes? You could have buried it elsewhere on the island before you caught up to us, the captain growled. Gawain remembered that he had been furious when, after finding the legendary gold of Atahualpa, he had only been able to take the statues and a bag of coins before his crew was attacked by locals. Now even those were gone. This is just me checking that I've spelt Atahualpa correctly. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but that's okay. I am writing the book. I will probably not be the person who reads the audiobook if there ever is one. A-T-A-H-U-A-L-P-A. -A -A Atahualpa. Confirm, confirm. The last Incan emperor. After defeating his brother, Atahualpa became very briefly the last supper Inca of the Inca Empire before the Spanish conquest ended his reign. There you go. Spelled correctly. Go, Jack. Marie chuckled, her hot breath right behind Gawain's ear. Well then, better put your weapons down. If I did bury it elsewhere, and I'm not saying I did, mind, how are you going to find it without my help? No one said anything for a minute. A swallow twittered in the evening air. Gawain could faintly hear the royal fortune creaking in the distant ocean. Dozens of other pirates were on board, and he was sure that most were loyal to their captain. But the trees screened the ship from view. To make the crew aware that there was trouble on the island, Gawain would have to run up to the cliffs and wave a makeshift flag. Even then, it would take at least ten minutes for a second landing party to get here. So, Marie said, 
Let's all put our weapons down, shall we? The captain kept his cutlass raised. You first. Marie pressed the hook a little harder against Gawain's skin. You're risking your son's life over your pride. If he dies, I promise you'll be at the devil's gate soon after. Gawain slowly reached into his pocket with one hand, not the pocket with the trowel and the ball bearings, the one full of dust. Because he had just remembered that it wasn't dust, it was gunpowder from cleaning the cannons. The devil, eh? Marie was saying. I'm ready to introduce myself. Are you? Gawain flung the gunpowder into the hair. <laughs> Gawain flung the gunpowder into the air. Everyone jumped back, including Marie. Her hook dragged across Gawain's throat, but he was prepared. He twisted sideways and didn't get cut. Marie staggered back, sneezing, as the cloud of grey powder settled over everyone. Give me a second, that's my son. I'm back. He wanted to make me a cup of coffee. It appears to be a mixture of sand and water. Children. Uh, where were we? Marie staggered back, sneezing as the cloud of grey powder settled over everyone. Jonah lunged at Marie, dagger raised. Don't, Gawain said. There's gunpowder in the air and on our clothes. Jonah froze, his blade about to clash with Marie's hook. Rebus lowered the mattock, which he had apparently intended to use as a club. One spark and we all go up in flames, Gawain continued. He didn't know if this was true, but it sounded good. There's no treasure for anyone if we're dead. We'll get to the bottom of this without violence. The captain raised an eyebrow. Not all problems can be solved with words, son. Gawain met his gaze. Not all problems can be solved with a blade, either. The captain nodded slowly. Very well. And how do you suggest we get the truth from this viper? As I've already told you, Marie snapped, I didn't take the gold. In fact, amongst the six of us, she trailed off as if deep in thought. While she was distracted, Rebus flung his mattock at her. Don't, Gawain yelled. Too late. Marie raised her hook to protect her face. The mattock's blade clanged against the hook, creating a spark. A ball of flame swallowed the head of the mattock and Maria's arm. She screamed as the fire spread. A blast of heat sent Gawain reeling. Marie stumbled into Jonah, arms flapping. There was a bright flash as Jonah's clothes, still dusted with gunpowder, powder, ignited. His mouth opened and closed in panic, but made no sound. Gawain watched, horrified. This was all his fault. Soon the whole island could catch fire. Thinking quickly, he ran towards the two burning pirates. Son, stay back, the captain shouted. Gawain ducked under his father's outstretched arms and barged into Marie. The fire crawled across his clothes, scorching the fine hairs off his arms. He squeezed his eyes shut again as the pain he squeezed his eyes shut against the pain as they crashed into Jonah together. Then all three of them tumbled into the hole. As Gawain hit the bottom, the impact shoved all the air out of his lungs. The earth down here was cold and wet, unlike the sandy stuff above. He scrabbled at the walls, showering himself and the other pirates with dirt. The flames hissed as they were extinguished. The captain appeared in the cloud of steam above, a red apparition in his damask waistcoat. Gawain, are you all right? Gawain's mouth was full of mud and grit. I'm fine, he sputtered. The other two pirates moaned beneath him. They would live. Captain, I mean, Gawain had seen worse burns in the ship's galley. He found his hand resting on the gold coin. He picked it up and blinked the dirt out of his eyes. It wasn't a coin at all. It had no markings, save for two ragged lumps near the centre. It must be the base of one of the missing statues. Gold was a soft metal. The base could easily have broken off. But why would the thief have left it behind? It would be easy to slip into a pocket, and still worth a pretty penny on its own. Six of us, he muttered. Marie, you said amongst the six of us. Marie simply groaned. Gawain was about to ask again, but then he figured it out for himself. She had meant five pirates and a dog. Father, Gawain hissed, where's Rebus? Rebus, he, ah, clang. It was the sound of iron on bone. The captain hit the ground with a thud. No, Gawain cried. He scrambled up out of the hole in time to see Rebus and his dog sprinting away into the forest, Rebus still carrying the mattock. Gawain shook, his, shook the captain. Father. The captain tried to stand, but collapsed immediately, clutching his head. I'll be fine. Get after him. Go. Gawain ran, following the trail left by Rebus's boots. He should have seen the clues earlier. After burying the treasure, the five pirates had walked back to the ship. Marie had excused herself briefly, and then Rebus had whistled. 
His dog had emerged from the forest, shaking dirt and sand from her fur. The whole time they were walking, the dog could have been digging the treasure back up and burying it somewhere else. Pardon me. No wonder the base had broken off one of the statues and been left behind. A man would go back for a piece of gold, no matter how small, but a dog wouldn't. It was Rebus who had said they all walked together, cleverly reminding Gawain that Marie hadn't been with them the whole time. And it had been Rebus who had thrown the mattock, distracting everybody just as Marie was about to figure out the truth. Now Gawain was chasing him with no weapons and no plan. Rebus was running uphill towards the cliffs. He seemed to have a plan, but Gawain had no idea what it was. Gawain raced up the hill, his heart ready to burst, his head still spinning from the fall down the hole. The wind felt cold against his gunpowder burns. His boots thumped the dirt, startling centipedes and working ants up into a fury. Soon he broke through the last of the trees and found himself in a clearing at the top of the hill. There was Rebus, standing not far from the edge of the cliff, waving a kerchief in the air. Gawain could see the royal fortune floating in the distance. The wind had died and the black flag hung limp, hiding the skeleton and the hourglass painted on the fabric. A second longboat was being lowered over the side. Rebus, Gawain said, it's over. Rebus whirled around. One of his hands disappeared into his coat and came back holding a flintlock pistol. We know it was you, Gawain said. There's no point running. Better to surrender. Take your chances walking the plank. Rebus brandished the pistol. Wrong. I can handle you and your father and those two other scoundrels. And those other other two scoundrels. Two other? Other two? Other two. Then you'll be stranded on the island to starve, Gawain said. Think, Rebus. The crew of the Royal Fortune won't care that their captain is gone as long as they have the gold and four fewer pirates with whom to share it. Soon the ship will be mine. Gawain dug through his pockets again and pulled out a fistful of ball bearings. Don't come any closer. I've faced down... Hmm... Now, see, he says, don't come any closer, as though Rebus were coming closer, which he is not. But I can make it so he is. Soon the ship will be mine. Uh, I'll just say... Soon the ship will be mine. Rebus advanced on Gawain. Now, I already said he was holding up his pistol. Taking aim. That'll do. Rebus advanced on Gawain, taking aim. Gawain dug through his pockets again and pulled out a fistful of ball bearings. Don't come any closer. I've faced down cannonballs, boy, Rebus sneered. You really think you can scare me with... He trailed off, looking over Gawain's shoulder. Suddenly he did appear scared. His eyes widened and the colour drained from his cheeks. There was a rustling sound behind Gawain. He turned. Bushes in the distance were shifting, as though in a strong breeze. But the air was still. Something was coming. Hello? Gawain called out. A strange light appeared between the trees. Bright spots swirled across the trunks and leaves like firelight, but there was no smoke, no heat, no crackling sound. The poor bride, Rebus breathed. No, Gawain thought. Impossible. The light got brighter and closer. The shrubbery shifted as though an invisible woman were marching through it towards them. Rebus backed away from the forest. No, he screamed. You can have the gold. Take it. Just don't. Then he took a step that wasn't there. Arms pinwheeling, he toppled backwards off the cliff. He shrieked in terror the whole way down. The dog emerged from the rustling bushes, tail wagging. The gold statue with the missing base was in her mouth. As soon as Gawain saw it, the strange light no longer seemed mystical. It was simply the glow of the setting sun reflected off the statue's gleaming features. The dog ran to the edge of the cliff and looked down. Her tail continued to wag. She placed the statue carefully on the dirt and sat waiting for her master to return. Okay, five stories down, five to go. Hope you liked it.